Okay, I'm trying this for like the fourth time. The dogs ruined one take, the computer froze and corrupted my files on another. For some reason, the computer just does not want you to read scene six of act four, which is sad because it's an awesome scene. So we have a number of people we are going to have, remember, um, Gloucester, Gloucester had asked uh, poor Tom to lead him to the cliffs of Dover so he could throw himself off. Well, Dover, the cliffs happen to be right between Dover where the French have landed and where the English, uh, Cornwall and Albany are bringing their armies down. But remember, Cornwall is dead. So his armies are probably being led by Regan who seems perfectly able of picking up a sword and doing some violence. Who else do you have in this territory between the French and the English? Well, Oswald is out with that letter trying to find Edmund who is spying on the French. Uh, and if you remember, both sisters were sending, trying to send letters to Edmund. Apparently he is a hottie and they all want him. I should have gotten the picture of Gaston. That would have made a good Edmund. Uh, who else do you have in there? Kent is looking for Lear. Lear is wandering somewhere dressed in weeds and flowers. Remember, he made himself a, a crown out of weeds. They told us that last act. Yes, a uh, crown of weeds. That's not symbolic, not at all. Shakespeare is definitely not subtle. And then the last people you have wandering around in this area uh, are Cordelia's people. Because remember, Cordelia sent out a whole bunch of people to find her father because she's so worried and she was crying. Uh, when she got Kent's letter describing how her father's kind of losing touch with reality. So this time the gentleman, again, we're just using the knight for the gentleman. Um, this time the gentleman has a couple servants with him and they are all coming from Cordelia looking for the king so that they can save him. So considering the two armies are about to hit, there are a lot of people wandering the countryside between. So we start off with Gloucester and Tom. When shall we come to the top of that same hill? You do climb up it now. Look how we labor. Methinks the ground is even. Horrible steep. Hark, do you hear the sea? No, truly. Why then your other senses grow imperfect by your eyes anguish. So Tom is saying, wow, we're climbing this steep hill. I can hear the ocean. We're definitely on the cliffs of Dover. And Gloucester's like, the hill doesn't seem that steep and I don't hear the ocean because they're totally not on the cliffs of Dover. They're climbing a little tiny hill because there's no way Edgar's going to let his dad commit suicide that way. It may be indeed. Methinks thy voice is altered, and thou speakest in better phrase and matter than thou didst. You're much deceived. Nothing I am changed but in my garments. Methinks you are better spoken. Come on, sir. Here's the place. Stand still. How fearful and dizzy tis to cast one's eyes so low the crows and choughs that wing the midway air show scarce so gross as beetles halfway down hangs one that gathers samphire's dreadful trade methinks he seems no bigger than his head and the fishermen that walk upon the beach appear like mice and yawned tall anchoring bark diminished to her cock a her cock a bowie almost too small for sight. The murmuring surge that on the unnumbered idle pebbles chafe cannot be heard so high. I'll look no more lest my brain turn and the deficient sight topple down headlong. Set me where you stand. Give me your hand. You are now within a foot of the extreme verge for all beneath the moon would I not leap upright. Let go my hand. Here, friends, another purse. In it, a jewel, well worth a poor man's taking. Fairies and gods, prosper it with thee. Go thou farther off, bid me farewell, and let me hear you going. 
Okay, that's a little ironic. Remember, Edgar is actually his oldest son. So he says, I'm dying and I want you to have the last of my treasures. And that is my purse with this jewel that's so valuable. So he's actually giving Edgar his rightful inheritance, the inheritance he once took away and gave to Edmund. He just doesn't know that he's doing it. Now, fare you well, good sir, with all my heart. Why do I trifle thus with his despair? It is done to cure it. Oh my God, why am I feeling so guilty about this? I'm only tricking my father to cure him of this suicidal tendency. It's kind of interesting here. What Edgar's talking about is that he's deceiving his father. Well, that's the exact same sin that Goneril and Regan committed. They lied to their father about their love, about their commitment. But in their case, they lied to their father for selfish reasons. Edgar is lying to his father to try and cure his father of this suicidal tendency. So he's feeling guilty for lying when he's doing it for the right reasons. They feel no guilt, even though they did it for the wrong reasons. So it's an interesting contrast looking at how the children are deceiving their parents and looking at how they feel about that deception. Oh, you mighty gods, this world I do renounce and in your sight shake patiently my great affliction off. If I could bear it longer and not fall to quarrel with your great opposeless wills, my snuff and loathe parts of nature should burn itself out. If Edgar live, oh, bless him. Now, fellow, fare thee well. And he falls forward. Gone, sir, farewell. And yet I know not how conceit may rob the treasury of life when life itself yields to the theft. Had he been where he thought by this, had thought been passed. I don't know how to save someone from being robbed when they want to be robbed. How do I, how do I stop my father from wanting to die? Because if he wants to die, there are lots of people out here that want him dead and it's going to happen. Alive or dead? Ho, you, sir! Friend, hear you, sir! Speak! Thus he might indeed, yet he revives! What are you, sir? What are you, sir? In other words, who are you? Edgar, who was pretending to be poor Tom, is now pretending to be a completely different random person. Because remember, Gloucester believes that he jumped off the cliffs of Dover, bah! and would be at the very bottom poor Tom would still be at the top. So he is pretending to be a new random person. There are a lot of disguises in this. And now he's saying, oh my gosh, who are you? Are you alive? I just saw you fall off the cliffs of Dover. Holy crap. By the way, if you fell off the cliffs of Dover, you would be dead. Like zero chance of this. Oh, way. And let me die. Hadst thou, hadst thou been aught but gossamer, feathers, air, so many fathom down precipitating, thou shiverest like an egg. But thou dost breathe, hast heavy substance, bleedest not, speakest, art sound. Ten masts at each make not the, the altitude from which thou hast perpendicularly fell but thy life's a miracle. Speak yet again. But have I fallen or no? Why does he not know? Because he was so scared about dying that when he fell forward off this little hill, he passed out. That's why Edgar could talk about, you know, oh my gosh, I feel guilty about this because his dad had passed out cold. Yeah. So now he's really confused. But have I fallen or no? From the dread summit of this chalky bourne, look up a height. The shrill gorged lark so far cannot be seen or heard, but do look up. Alack, 
I have no eyes. Is wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself by death? Twas yet some comfort when misery could beguile the tyrant's rage and frustrate his proud will. Give me your arm up. So, how is it? Feel you your legs? You stand? Too well. Too well. This is above all strangeness. Upon the crown of the cliff, what thing was that which parted from you? A poor, unfortunate beggar. As I stood here below, methought his eyes were two full moons. He had a thousand noses. Horns whelked and waved like the enriched sea. It was some fiend, therefore. Hap thou happy father, think that the clearest gods who made the honors of men's impossibilities have preserved thee. So he's upset that the thought of having fallen wasn't enough to cure his father of wanting to die. His father's still like, oh my gosh, do I have to climb the cliffs again? How sad I didn't die. So Edgar's changing tactics. He's like, oh my gosh, it was a demon. It was Satan himself who was trying to get you to jump and the God saved you. Well, if Satan tells you to do something, if a demon tells you to do something, clearly you shouldn't do it. So again, he is trying to play this trick on his father to get his father to stop wanting death. I do remember now, henceforth, affliction, <clears throat> henceforth, I'll bear affliction till it do cry out itself enough, enough, and die. That thing you spake of. I took it for a man. Often t'would say, the fiend, the fiend. He led me to that place. Bear free and patient thoughts. But who comes here? Mm, dressed in weeds and flowers, who would that be? The safest sense will never accommodate his master thus. No, they cannot touch me for coining. I am the king himself. The crazy is catching. Oh, thou side piercing sight. Nature's above art in that respect. There's your press money. Oh, that fellow, he handles his bow like a crow keeper. Draw me a clothier's car yard. Look, look, a mouse. Peace, peace. This piece of toasted cheese will do it. Here's my gauntlet. Oh, I'll prove it on a giant. Bring up the brown bills. Oh, well, flown bird in the cloud, in the cloud. Ha <laughs> ha, give a word. Sweet martyr. Pass. Uh, I know that voice. Ha. <laughs> Goneril with a white beard. Yeah, he totally looks like Goneril. Goneril with a white beard. Thy flattened me like a dog and told me I had white hairs in my beard and the black ones were there to say I and no to everything I said. I and no too was no good divinity when the rain came to wet me and the wind to make me chatter, when the thunder would not peace at my bidding, there I found him. There I smelt him out. Go to, they are not men of their words. They told me I was everything. Tis a lie. I am not ague proof. The trick of that voice, uh, I do well remember. Is it not the king? Aye, every inch a king. When I do stare, see how the subject quakes. I pardon that man's life. What was the ca thy cause? Adultery? Thou shalt not die for adultery, no. The wren goes to it, and the small gilded fly does lecture in my sight. Let copulation thrive for Gloucester's bastard son. 
was kinder to his father than my daughter's got betwixt the lawful sheets. Wow, that is a weird mix of arguments. He says, I will not punish a man for adultery because, you know, all animals are adulterers. They sleep with whatever animal is there. That's his first argument. His second one is adultery can't be all that bad because my daughters, which were legal daughters, are horrible. And Glo Gloucester's adulterous bastard son is a wonderful boy. Yeah, because Edmund is awesome. That argument might not be as good as Lear thinks it is. <gasps> to it, luxury pell-mell, for I lack soldiers. Behold, yon simpering dame, whose face between her forks presages snow, that minces virtue, and does shake the head to hear a pleasure's name. The, the fits you, nor the spoil, soiled horse goes to it, with a more riotous appetite. Down from the waist, they are centaurs, the women all above. Centaurs were known for being creatures of, of passion. They were violent. They were sexual. So, um, Lear, how about you accuse your daughters of being horrible people instead of saying all women are that way? I'm pretty sure I'm offended. But, you know, he's not all that sane, so we'll forgive him for that. But to the girdle do the gods inherit beneath all, beneath is all the fiends. There's hell, there's darkness, there's the sulfurous pit, burning, scalding stench, consumption. Fie, 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 pah, pah. Give me an ounce of civet, good apothecary, to sweeten thy imagination. There's money for thee. Oh. Let me kiss the hand. Let me wipe it first. It smells of mortality. Oh, ruined piece of nature. This great world shall so wear out to naught. Dost thou know me? I remember thine eyes well enough. Dost thou squinny at me? I remember your eyes. Are you squinting at me? Yeah. Nice thing to say to somebody whose eyes have been gouged out. <gasps> no. Do thy worst, blind Cupid. I'll not love. Thou read this challenge. Mark but the penning of it. Were all the letters sons, I could not see one. <sighs> I would not take this from report. It is, and my heart breaks at it. Read! What, with the case of eyes? Oh, ho, are you there with me? No eyes in your head, nor money in your purse. Your eyes are in a heavy case, and your purse is light. Yet you see how this world goes. I see it feelingly. What? Art mad? A man may see how the world goes with no eyes. Look with thine ears. See how yon justice rails upon yon simple thief. Hark in thine ear. Change places and handy dandy. Which is the justice? Which is the thief? Thou hast seen a farmer's dog bark at a beggar? Aye, sir. And the creature run from the cur. There thou mightest behold the, the great image of authority. A dog's obeyed in office. Thou rascal beetle, hold thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? Strip thine own back that hotly lust to use her in kind for that which thou whippest her. Oh, he kind of has a point there. He's saying you want to punish the whore when you're the person who paid her. She wouldn't be a whore if you hadn't paid her because it's your lust, not hers. <clears throat> so he's saying, if you want to whip someone, whip yourself. So I might actually agree with him on that one. Take responsibility for your own sins. And that's kind of creepy that I'm agreeing with the crazy guy dressed in weeds and flowers.
The usurer hangs on the cosener. Through tattered clothes, small vices do appear. Robes and furred gowns hide all. Plate sin with gold. And the strong lance of justice, hurtless, breaks. Arm it in rags. A pygmy straw does pierce it. None does offend. None, I say. I'll able him. Take that of me, my friend, who have the power to seal the accuser's lips. Get the glass eyes like a scurvy politician. Seem to see things that thou dost not. Now, 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 pull off my boots. Harder, harder so. Oh, matter and impertinency mixed. Reason in madness. So he's saying, oh, he's got some reason there, but it's in the middle of a lot of madness. If thou wilt ma weep my fortunes, take my eyes. I know thee well enough. Thy name's Gloucester, that thou must be patient. We came crying hither, thou knowest the first time that we smelt the air, we, we yowl and cry. I will preach to thee, Mark, alack, alack the day. When we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools, this good block. It were a delicate stratagem to, sh to shoe a troop of horses with felt. I'll put it in proof. And when I have stolen upon these son-in-laws, then kill, 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 kill. He's going to take horses and put felt on their hoofs so that they can sneak up so that their hoof beats are soft. And then he's going to kill his son-in-laws. Now, the irony is his son-in-laws are not the problem. Cornwall is dead. Yeah, he was a sadistic, horrible person, but he's gone. And Albany is the one who ripped into Goneril because she was treating her father so poorly. So he is like, I'm going for my son-in-laws. And he doesn't recognize that the real problem, not his son-in-laws, it's his daughters. He still doesn't want to admit that. So, yeah, he is not doing well with reality. And here come the gentlemen. Yeah, close enough. And servants. And remember, these guys were sent by Cordelia to find her father and to bring him to safety. Oh, here he is. Lay hands upon him, sir, your most dear daughter. No, rescue? What? A prisoner? I am even the natural fool of fortune. Use me well. You shall have ransom. Let me have surgeons. I am cut to the brains. He heard daughter, and he assumes it's Regan or Goneril, and he starts crying for help. Uh, you shall have anything. No seconds. Oh, myself, why, this would make a man a man of salt to use his eyes for garden water pots. Ay, and laying autumn's dust. Good sir, I will die bravely like a bridegroom. What? I will be jovial. Ha ha! Come, come! I am a king, my masters, you know that. You are a royal one, and, and we obey you then there's life in it. Nay, if you get it, you shall get it with running. Sa, 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 run, run, run. Servants, run after crazy king to go get him to save him from himself because he's crazy. A sight more pitiful than the meanest wretch past speaking of in a king. Thou hast one daughter who redeems in nature from the general curse which twain have brought her to. Hey, sorry, wrong guy. Hail, gentle sir. Sir, speed you. What is your will? Do you hear aught, sir, uh, of a battle toward? Most sure and vulgar, everyone hears that which can distinguish sound. But by your favor, how nears the other army? 
Near on and speedy foot, the main to cry stands on the hourly thought. I thank you, sir, that's all. Though that the queen on special cause is here, her army is moved on. I thank you, sir. So Cordelia is staying behind in Dover to try and find her father, while the French army is moving out to deal with the English armies of Cornwall and Albany who are coming. And gentlemen leaves chasing crazy king and the two servants who are chasing the crazy king. Apparently we just have a parade of people through this battlefield. You ever gentle gods, take my breath from me. Let not my worser spirit tempt me again to die before you please. Well, pray you, Father. Father. He just named Gloucester Father. Now, sir, what are you? A poor man made tame to fortune's blows who by the art of known and feeling sorrows am pregnant to good pity give me your hand i'll lead you to some bidding oh, hearty thanks and the bounty and the benison of heaven to boot and boot Oswald. <gasps> A proclaimed prize, most happy, that eyeless head of thine was first framed flesh to raise my fortunes. Thou old unhappy traitor, briefly thyself remember, the sword is out that must destroy thee. Oh my God, I'm so totally going to get that reward. Come here, I got my sword out. I want to chop that old man's head off. And he is attacking a blind old man with a sword. Charming. These people, they're just all sick. Now let thy friendly hand put strength enough to it. If you're going to kill me, put strength in your hand. I thought we got past this suicidal thing, but nope. Wherefore, pe bold peasant, darest thou to support a published traitor? <sighs> Edgar stepped in front of his father. Dad is like, yeah, if you're going to kill me, make sure you're strong enough to do it. And Edgar steps in front like, eh, no, no, this is not happening. We are not doing this. And Oswald is like, holy crap, a, a peasant getting in the middle? No, you don't even have a sword. Like, don't go there. <clears throat> Hence, lest that infection of his fortune take like hold on thee, let go his arm. Chill and not let go, sir, without further causation. Let go, slave, for thou diest. Good gentlemen, go your gate and let poor folk pass. A chud, ah, bizzerwig of my life, t'would not ha been so long as fortnight. Nay, come not so near the old man. Keep out your oars, ah, as he, whether thou cossard or my ballow be, the harder. Chilla. Be plain with you. It's playing poor Tom again. <laughs> Out, dunghill. Chilla, pick your teeth, sir. Come, no matter for your foins. Why would he pretend to be crazy? Because this guy's not going to expect good sword play from a crazy guy. He then attacks. Da, 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 da. Edgar knocks him down. <gasps> Slave, thou hast slain me, villain. Take my purse. If ever thou wilt thrive, bury my body and give the letters which thou findest about me to Edmund, Earl of Gloucester. Seek him out upon the British party. Oh, untimely death. I know thee well, serviceable villain, as duteous to the vices of thy mistress as badness would desire. What? Is he dead? Sit you down, father. Rest you. 
Let's see these pockets. The letters that he speaks of may be my friends. He's dead. I am only sorry he had no other death, death's man. Let us see. Leave gentle wax and manners. Blame us not. We know our enemies' minds. We'd rip their hearts, their papers. Is more lawful. He reads then from the papers, which he knows it isn't lawful to break someone else's seal, but he's like, dude, done worse. Let our reciprocal vows be remembered. You have many opportunities to cut him off. If your will want not time and place will be fruitfully offered, there is nothing done. If he return the conqueror, then I am the prisoner and his bed, my goal. From the loathed warmth, wherefore deliver me and supply the place of your labor, your wife, so I would say affectionate servant, Goneril. Wow, look at what she's saying. I'm a prisoner to my husband's bed. If he managed to get killed in this conflict with the French, that might not be so bad. And I would love to call myself your wife. Ooh, wait a minute. Who else has been talking marriage with Edmund? Oh yeah, this is gonna end well. However, she's not here. Edgar is reading her letter. Oh, distinguished space of woman's will. Okay, seriously, what is it with you guys blaming all women for the fact that Goneril's horrible? Oh, undistinguished space of woman's will, a plot upon her virtuous husband's life and the exchange of my brother here in the sands, thee I'll rake up, the post unsanctified of murderous lectures in the same mature time with this ungracious paper strike the sight of the death practiced duke for him, tis well that of thy death and business, I can tell. The king is mad. How stiff is my vile sense that I stand up and have ingenious feeling of my huge sorrow. Better I were distract. So should my thought be severed from my griefs and woes by wrong imaginations lose the knowledge of themselves. Give me your hand. Off in the distance, drums. Those would be the marching drums for the armies, which means they're pretty darn close to the war. Far off, methinks, I hear the beaten drum. Come, father, I'll bestow you with a friend. Father and son are reunited. And they now know that Edmund is plotting to kill Albany and that Albany is not so invested in this idea of trying to get rid of Lear. So people are starting to unravel what's going on. And that is the end of act six, or I'm sorry, scene six. We have one more scene in this act, act four, and then we're ready for the big finale.